Hello and welcome to this episode of Night Sky News for September 2021 with me, astrophysicist Dr. Becky Smethurst. This is a show where we chat about everything you should look out for in the night sky in the coming months and we chat about what's been happening in space news in the past month. There's chapter titles if you want to skip ahead to any specific news story and any scientific research papers I mentioned, they'll all be linked in the video description down below. So without any further ado, let's kick things off and start by looking up. So the night that this video goes live, Thursday the 16th of September, the almost full moon is going to be pairing up with the planet Saturn. And this is going to be visible from wherever you are in the world, from just after sunset to around about, you know, just after midnight time. By the 17th, the moon will have actually moved halfway between Saturn and the other planet, Jupiter, that's nearby. And then by Saturday the 18th, the moon will be on the other side of Jupiter. This is a similar setup to what happened last month, chatted about it in last month's Night Sky News too, for those of you who remember. If you missed your chance then, here's your extra chance to actually use the moon to be able to spot Jupiter and Saturn so that you know what you're looking for throughout the rest of the month and you'll be able to pick them out on the sky after using the moon to know that that is definitely Jupiter and Saturn that you're actually looking at. Jupiter is always going to be the brighter of the two, whereas Saturn will be fainter because it's further away from us and it also has that yellowish tint too. Now if you have a telescope or binoculars lying around the house, break them out. This is when you should break them out for Jupiter and Saturn because with Jupiter, even with binoculars, you should be able to see Jupiter's four largest moons and if you look night after night as well, you'll be able to see those moons moving and changing positions. For Saturn, if you actually want to be able to see the rings of Saturn, you're gonna need a telescope with at least 25 times magnification. Even then you'll probably only see like, what looks like little ears of Saturn, right? If you actually wanna be able to see detail in the rings of Saturn and resolve all of the, the different features there, you're gonna need a telescope that's got at least 50 times magnification to do that. Then on the 22nd of September, 2021, at 2021 BST is the equinox. And it marks the official astronomical start of autumn in the Northern Hemisphere and spring in the Southern Hemisphere. And you might be thinking, how can the equinox, which is like the day of equal day and equal night, have an exact time that it occurs at? Because isn't it supposed to be like the whole day and night that's equal. It's because the equinox is being equal day, equal night. That's not the official definition of the equinox. The official definition is when the sun crosses the celestial equator. So the celestial equator, if you picture sort of like the night sky as like a sphere surrounding earth, you might want to like map out, right? And you take the equator of the earth and you sort of project it outwards onto the inside sort of sphere of, of the night sky. That is the celestial equator. Now the Earth spins on its side though by 23 degrees, so the plane of the solar system is offset from the equator. We call this the ecliptic. It's actually the path that the sun and all the planets take through the sky. So that's why the equinox happens at an exact time, right? Because it's the exact time when the sun crosses the celestial equator. And that essentially happens when the earth is not tilted towards or away from the sun. And the equator of the earth essentially lines up with the plane of the solar system. And their happy coincidence is therefore that we have equal day and equal night as well. It's a thing to celebrate for us astronomers, at least in the northern hemisphere anyway, because it means longer nights are coming and that means more time to stargaze. It means we can catch sights like this on Saturday the 25th of September when the just past full moon pairs up with one of my favourite night sky sights, the Pleiades star cluster. And again, this is visible all around the world, wherever you are. It's a star cluster that looks a little bit like, um, like a mini plow constellation or like a big dipper. It's about, with the naked eye anyway, it looks like six to eight stars, right? But if you get a good camera on it or binoculars or a telescope again, you'll actually see tens if not hundreds more stars, depending on how powerful your telescope is. You might even see some of the nebulous gas around the stars in the star cluster too, if you're lucky. Moving into October now, and the Draconids meteor shower are gonna be peaking around about the Friday the 8th and Saturday the 9th of October. Now, all of these meteors are going to appear as if they're streaking away from the constellation of Draco. So this unfortunately means that this is only gonna be visible if you're in the Northern Hemisphere. 
Now, admittedly, the Draconids is not the most active of meteor showers. So, for example, we just had the Perseids meteor shower in August, which is like one of the best meteor showers of the year. It's upwards of 60 meteors per hour, which means if you're in a very dark sky, you'll see everything from the brightest to the faintest. You might even see a meteor a minute. Like, there's a lot of meteors that you can actually spot. The Draconids, though, are probably more like 10 an hour. So if you don't have that dark of a sky, you know, okay, maybe if you were in that, a really dark sky, you'd see one every five minutes or so, but you're probably looking at more like one every 10 to 20 minutes or so. But if you want to make a night of it where you spend an hour outside or so stargazing at the time, it will be perfect. Because for me, this is actually one of the better meteor showers because of when it peaks. Most meteor showers, including the Perseids, are like it peaks really after midnight, the wee hours of the morning. So you really have to like commit to doing this. Whereas the Draconids peak just after sunset. Like in the time between like sunset and midnight is like the best time to observe them while the constellation of Draco is still quite high in the sky. So you can kind of like just have your tea and then just like nip out and sit outside in your garden for an hour and just lie down and, and look up and see if you can spot any. And so it, it's kind of like it's one of the more like convenient meteor showers to observe so maybe some of you will get on board with that like I do. While you're out there though looking for meteors you should also look out towards the horizon as well where the sun is setting and you might catch a glimpse of the incredibly bright Venus pairing up with a very thin crescent moon, my favourite, the toenail moon. And this pairing is just made all the more gorgeous by the fact that this is happening like right at sunset. So the colors involved are spectacular. I know this because last month the same thing happened and you all sent me so many beautiful pictures of you catching this sight all around the world. So keep all your pictures coming my way this month as well. You know, anything that you happen to, to catch in the night sky this month, send it to me over on social media so that I can also, you know, share it with the world too, you know, the, the parts of the world where it was probably clouded over when these things were happening and we happened to miss them. This is why I love getting your, your pictures in case I missed it too. Anyway, that's enough for looking up at the night sky for this month. Let's come back down to earth with a bump and chat about what's been happening in space news in the past month. <laughs> Let's start with this, frankly, stunning image, you know, released by the Hubble Space Telescope team at ESA last month. It's of an Einstein ring, and it's one of the most complete rings that we've ever seen. So an Einstein ring is caused by something called gravitational lensing. So in Einstein's theory of general relativity, which is our best theory we have for how gravity works, basically says that mass curves space. And this is what causes the effect of gravity. So you can picture this at least in two dimensions, is if you put like a, a basketball in the middle of a trampoline or, or a sheet that you stretch tall, and that curves the surface of the trampoline or the sheet. Then take a ping pong ball and set it off going in a straight line, it will get bent. Its path will get curved by the curvature of space. And this is how we think like the orbits of planets around the sun works. And what it means is that any light traveling on that curved space as well doesn't travel in straight lines like you learn at school, but it actually gets its path bent, it gets it curved by this uh, very curved region of space because you've got this massive object there. It means that massive objects act a little bit like a, a lens in the fact that they change and, and can focus the path of light. So you can actually recreate what's happening here in this gra in this image of this gravitational lens just using a stemmed wine glass, right? The bottom wine glass is a little bit like a lens. And if you, if you light a candle or if you have sort of like a, a lamp in the background or something like that, and you can move the wine glass in front of the candle, you'll reach that exact perfect alignment where the bottom of the wine glass acts as this lens to give you this ring of light. It's bent the light into this ring. And if you move it slightly off, you'll just sort of get almost like an arc shape because the two aren't perfectly aligned anymore. So in this image of an Einstein ring, what you've got is that you've got a galaxy in the foreground and then you've got a bright galaxy in the background. And this galaxy here is acting like a lens, bending this light from this galaxy into a ring. But what you can see with this image though, is that the ring, it's not quite perfect, right? It's, it's a little faint at the top and it's also got these sort of four bright spots around it as well, which is known as an Einstein cross because again, the alignment is not quite perfect. It's probably caused by the fact that it's not just one massive galaxy doing the lensing, it's two. Take a look at this image and we'll zoom right into the center. 
You see that there's two sort of yellow spots of light there. That's actually two galaxies that are actually massive enough to create this lens effect. And I absolutely loved how Dr. Pamela Gay put this on Twitter. She essentially said that like gravity fell in love with these two galaxies and decided to put a ring on it. A ring that's also got four diamonds on it too. It was great to see this image, not just because it was beautiful, but also because Hubble had all those hardware issues a few months ago. And there was that sort of anxious few weeks where we didn't know if it was gonna be back online and actually observing again. So knowing that it is and seeing images like this is just, really reassuring as an astronomer. Obviously Hubble is soon to be joined by the James Webb Space Telescope as well, which now has an official launch date, not just a target launch date, but an official launch date. So in the, my previous video that I made about the James Webb Space Telescope and how it's gonna revolutionize so many different fields of astrophysics, in that I talked about how the target launch date was the 31st of October, 2021. That has been missed now, unfortunately, due to the fact that the rocket that it was gonna be launched on had some issues, and so that was missed. But now, the James Webb Space Telescope has passed all of its final, 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 final checks, and it's also being prepared to be shipped out to the launch site, down through the Panama Canal to French Guiana, and has been given the official launch date of, drum roll please, the 18th of December, 2021. Put it in your diaries now, it's gonna be a nerve wracking day to say the least. I mean, everybody in the astronomy and astrophysics community is gonna be quite anxious about it, but especially those, you know, who've spent their entire careers, like 20 years working on this. It's, it's gonna be a huge day. And uh, I guess we just all have to hope that we just get a, a very nice early Christmas present of a successful launch. What we don't want is fire and smoke, which is what happened on the International Space Station this month. So on the night of Wednesday the 1st of September, the astronauts, the crew on board, were woken up by the sound of the smoke alarm and the smell of burning plastic and burning electronics. And they never found the source of that burning smell or why the, the smoke alarm went off. All they did was replace the air filters on the International Space Station, which dissipated the smell and nothing seemed to go wrong. And so apparently they all went back to sleep. <laughs> and this is why I could never be an astronaut because I would lie awake thinking that every tiny noise I heard was the entire space station <laughs> falling apart. I would be so anxious, but not the crew on board. Apparently they even did a spacewalk the next day just, you know, like it's no big deal. All jokes aside though, it is a little bit worrying. You know, it just serves as a reminder that the ISS is getting on a bit, right? I mean, it was built in 1998, right? Just this joint venture between the space agencies of Europe and Canada and Japan and Russia and the US, but it was always built with a lifetime of 15 years. And it's now 23 years later. So we're already pushing it a bit. In fact, Roscosmos, which is the Russian space agency, they announced last year that due to just general wear and tear on the International Space Station and the modules that they look after, I don't think the ISS will actually be functional past 2030. So this smoke alarm might be more of a, a reminder alarm that um, maybe one day in the not too distant future, I actually have to retire the International Space Station. Something that's not retiring anytime soon though is the Perseverance mission on Mars, little Percy the rover. It was actually captured on the surface this month by Ingenuity, the little drone that's with it, that's now helping it to actually scope out terrain and sort of where it should explore. Although you really do have to like squint and zoom in loads to actually spot it against, you know, the endless red rock Martian vista in this image. Now, if you remember from last month's Night Sky News episode, Perseverance tried to drill a hole in the surface of Mars to collect a rock sample. And the rock didn't play nice. It was essentially sand-like. So when they tried to collect the sample, all they ended up with is a little pile of sand at the bottom of the hole. <laughs> the team tried again though on September 1st, this time on a whole new rock that Ingenuity had actually scoped and found out for them and been like, this one looks good. And this time, success. Here is the rock in question, and you can clearly see that nice and neat little borehole. And more importantly, here you can see the sample tube actually contains the rock sample, unlike last time when it was worryingly empty. 
Why is it collecting these rock samples though, you might ask? Well, one of Perseverance's main science missions is astrobiology. Is there life on Mars? Yep, life on Mars. We're not talking about like little green men here. We're talking about probably microbial life, either current microbial life actually living on the surface of Mars today, or what's more likely is probably fossilized microbial life that was alive billions of years ago when we think that the Martian surface was much more habitable before it actually lost its atmosphere to what we call the solar wind, uh, dragging it off the planet Mars because Mars doesn't have a magnetic field to protect it from all the radiation from the sun like we do here on Earth. Now the aim is for Perseverance to collect a lot more of these rock samples. And what we wanna do with them is rigorous testing and analysis on them to try and work out, you know, what's the geology on Mars, perhaps what's the current climate compared to the past climate, and obviously also test to see if there are signs of life in these samples as well. To do that, you really need a lot of kit and a clean room ideally as well. And so that's not currently feasible on the surface of Mars, right? There's only so much you can send Perseverance with before it gets far too expensive to launch it to get there. So what's gonna happen is that NASA and ESA are playing a long game with these rock samples. So Perseverance is eventually going to drop all of the samples that it collects on the surface of Mars. Someone is gonna record that position with a giant big X so they don't forget where they put them. And eventually ESA is gonna send another mission which will collect those samples from the surface and bring them back to Earth. It's called the Mars Sample Return Mission. And the idea is to bring them back to Earth in the 2030s. What they'll do is send a lander with both an ESA rover to collect the samples and a rocket dubbed the Mars Ascent Vehicle or MAV. We are truly living in the film The Martian now, folks. Oh. As a result, the MAV for Ares 4 is Which will then perform the first ever liftoff from Mars. That'll put the samples into orbit around Mars and then another ESA mission will launch, collect that, and bring it back to Earth. As you can probably tell, it's incredibly complex. That's why we have to be patient and wait for the 2030s to get these samples of rock back that Perseverance has been collecting. In fact, the design for this mission isn't even finalized yet, right? So that's why we're having to wait so long. But the scientific returns from something like this will be absolutely huge. And the hope is that like the technology developed for this mission, for example, like the MAV, the, the Mars Ascent Vehicle, would be instrumental if we were ever to put like humans onto Mars or even a human base on Mars as well. It makes that all the more likely. I guess just then we have to be careful not to leave any random botanists on the surface. Surprise. All right, last but not least, I wanna talk about the newly released data from the EMU radio survey. So recently on my channel, I did a big video series on the recent results from the LOFAR collaboration, the LOFAR telescope in the Netherlands. It was a big radio image of the entire Northern Hemisphere sky, imaged in you know like 20 times more detail than we'd ever been able to before at those radio wavelengths. And in all of that hubbub, <laughs> more data from another radio survey has been released. This one from a radio telescope spread over six kilometers called the Australian Square Kilometer Array Pathfinder, or ASCAP, at the Murchison Radio Astronomy Observatory in Western Australia. The survey is the Evolutionary Map of the Universe Survey, or EMU, named after the big EMU in the sky, which is a really famous Aboriginal constellation outlining the darker, dusty patches of the Milky Way. So what's been released is data from the first pilot survey that they've done with EMU. And they've identified 220,000 radio objects. And it's particularly sensitive to really faint objects. So what's fun is that in this new survey, this pilot survey they've done, they found some really weird things that are completely unexplained. So first it reobserved the still unexplained odd radio circles or orcs that I've made a video about before on this channel. Actually, it's one of my favorites mainly because of the sheer amount of Lord of the Rings jokes that I was able to make in that video. And I remember the notification didn't go out to everyone who has notifications on on my channel. And so it didn't get seen by as many people. And I was really sad because it was like one of my favorites. I was like what I was most proud of as well. So I'll link it here if you 
want to check that out and hear more about odd radio circles. But anyway, they're still no closer to explaining these odd radio circles, but they've been able to rule out a few options so far anyway. But then they found this incredibly peculiar looking thing that the team has nicknamed the Dancing Ghosts. And they think it's associated with these two galaxies here. Perhaps it's like radio jets from the regions around the central supermassive black holes. You know, we usually see these as very like straight long jets that come out from these central regions, not from the black hole itself, but from the regions around the black hole, the accretion disk where the pressures increase. And then all of this material gets like funneled by magnetic fields into these huge jets that then give off radio waves. And you can see that instead of being straight, these jets here have almost been like bent and twisted, maybe by the fact that these two galaxies have been like interacting perhaps. And then here's another weird source. Again, they think it's one of these jets from the regions around a supermassive black hole, but this one has been like bent twice and they don't know why, right? There's no nearby galaxy to suggest that it's interacted with something. So what on earth caused this weird bending of the jet? So all these images from a paper that was released describing this pilot survey data released by Norris and collaborators. And it seriously was a fun read just because there's so many cool images and a whole lot of mystery in it. So I'm sure the EMU team are currently analyzing these unexplained sources in just you know excruciating detail, probably like trying to do follow-up observations with other telescopes at different wavelengths, like optical, or X-ray maybe, something like that, trying to figure out what's actually going on here with these sources. So I'm gonna be keeping a really close eye on what's called the archive, which is where people post brand new uh, astronomy research papers. They're all preprints, so they're free to access and free to read if you also wanna keep an eye on it too. But if anything's published by the team about these weird objects that they found in this survey, uh, I'll look out for them, give them a read, and then feedback to you guys right here on Night Sky News. So that's it for this month's Night Sky News. Um, if you want, you know, like up to date as it happens reactions from me about the latest space news, you can follow me over on Twitter and Instagram. But until next time, everybody, happy stargazing. Before we get to the bloopers, a big thank you from me to this week's video sponsor, Brilliant. Brilliant is a website and an app with a huge range of interactive courses on all topics from science and maths that get you to learn by doing. I personally think this is the best way that you learn and the interactivity on Brilliant is incredible. You know, you've probably heard me wax lyrical about Brilliant before if you've been here for a while, but what's impressed me so much is the effort that they've put into really upping the interactivity on their courses recently. I think this is particularly helpful in some of their maths courses. And I know a lot of you struggle with this because you message me about it all the time. So check out this one here on calculus, for example. Calculus is a fundamental tool that all scientists need in their arsenal. So having a really good grasp on it and how it works is so important. And I think the interactivity on Brilliant's courses gives you just that. So if that sounds like something you want to try, head to brilliant.org forward slash Dr. Becky, that is D-R-B-E-C-K-Y, and you can try it for free, plus get 20% off an annual premium subscription. The link is in the video description down below as well. So a huge thank you to Brilliant for sponsoring this video, and now you can roll those bloopers. You can see that with this new image, this new Einstein ring that's been found, the ring, oh my God, are you <laughs> kidding me, Becky? Are you f kidding me? This microphone's just been on the floor the entire time. I haven't had it clipped to me. What am I doing? So I just recorded pretty much the first half of this entire video, like through the whole night sky and I bit. Night sky and I bit? The night sky bit. And my microphone wasn't clipped to me. It was just lying on the floor. Very useful place for it to be, I'm sure you'll agree. Let's do it all again. <laughs> Something that's not retiring anytime soon though is the Perseverance mission on Mars. Perseverance mission. I shall persevere <laughs> in trying to pronounce Perseverance. <laughs> and it was just last year actually that Roscosmos, the Russian space agency, which um, I think about it, I don't think I've ever said Roscosmos out loud. Is it Roscosmos or is it like, Rose, I don't Rose Cosmos. I, Rose Cosmos. We're going with the northern pronunciation of it today. Cause if you like it, then you should put a nice time ring on it.